almost nine o'clock of a really, really nice summer day, and I am annoyed because I just came out from the unthin discussion. Someone who was trying to teach me that fight is dead with stealth, uh, all the engagements will be beyond visual range, and so dogfight is basically pointless. What if I told you that there is a piece of technology that nobody talks about, the key piece to allow beyond visual range engagement, and it works so-so. Obviously, the technology we are talking about is non-cooperative target recognition. We have already discussed this technology on the channel. Today we are going more in depth and we are also covering some of the logistic and operational problems that make target recognition necessary. We are particularly focusing on the radar part of the technology. The process of recognizing a target has four steps. First is the measurement of the aircraft signature. The second is the conditioning of the signal and the extraction of the features. The third is the application of the classifiers to the features. And the fourth is the use of the classifiers against a database of targets. Jet engine modulation tries to extract from the overall return from the aircraft the modulation that the jet engine blades, the, both the compressor or the turbine, cause on the reflected signal. It is a frequency domain technique and the type of waveform emitted by the radar necessary to do this kind of uh, recognition is something that has a very high spectral content of frequencies and a high pulse repetition frequency. And in case you are not familiar with the concept of frequency domain and time domain, well, don't worry because the differences are relatively easy to understand. If we analyze the radar return in the time domain, we are just considering and analyzing the intensity of the returning signal in time. What went out as a well-defined spike of energy is coming back all blurred and in, with a different shape. We just want to understand what kind of information we can extract from that shape. But the same signal, the same radio return, we can analyze in the frequency domain. This means that rather than looking at the shape of the return signal, we are looking at its components. Now, we can mathematically demonstrate, trust me on this, <laughs> that we can represent pretty much every signal, every wave, every radar return, but anything pretty much as a sum of waves. With an analysis in the frequency domain, we are splitting the radar return into its own basic components, and there are informations that we can extract from those. This is another important element to understand. To use these techniques, the radar must be capable of emitting pulses that are not just a blip, but they have a waveform that is actually uh, suitable to have a return that contains the features that you need to extract. This is something which is actually designed into the radar. The radar must be built to be capable of doing this, otherwise NCTR becomes almost impossible. The flip side of this is that while the radar is performing NCTR, it may not be able of doing uh, other activities. But still, the waveform that is used for the target recognition may not be the best waveform just to keep tracking. Another pretty common technique is the high resolution range profiling. Since the aircraft is a physical object which has dimensions, if I emit a blip toward the target that lasts some a very short time, the return may be spread in time. 
farthest parts of the aircraft, the return of the farthest parts of the aircraft arrives later than the return of the nearest part of the aircraft. So an emitted pulse that has a shape like this may come back like this. Now the shape of the radar return uh, seen in the time domain is somewhat indicative of the shape of the aircraft that can be used to recognize the aircraft. Now to use this technique you really need to have a very high accuracy of the radar. The, it is always possible actually to integrate several different pulses in a single return profile to, yeah, to better characterize the return. There are several other techniques that can be used like counting the rotation of the blades of an helicopter uh, rather than measuring the micro doppler effects that happen while the aircraft moves or vibrates or using a technology like the inverse synthetic upper radar which is actually capable of um, taking a very out of focus and pixelated picture of uh, the aircraft it would take too long to go into the details of all of them but the concepts are the same the way they are used is always the same you get a return you extract the features you apply classifiers and see how those classifiers match with your database The problem with non-cooperative target recognition in a radar is in the radar equation itself. We know that the power received by the radar, everything else being equal, depends on the fourth power of the range. With normal radar detection, we can just use the overall power of the return to identify a track. With these techniques, we need to peer into the details to extract the features. We are going to analyze very fine details, very small elements that can be at a power level that is quite below the overall received power. So the range at which you can perform this kind of recognition is definitely shorter and sometimes much shorter than the range of the radar. And again, since these signals are actually weak, the signal processing must be very effective in eliminating, for example, all the unwanted Doppler effects or the ground Doppler effects or the effects of jamming or any other disturbance. The amplification that we need needs to be a good quality that is must be capable of magnifying the signal quite a lot. The gain must be high and the intrinsic noise must be low which means that typically the amplifier that are used uh, in uh, these frequencies for this application are very, very expensive. Your stereo amplifier that you have in your living room won't cut it. So we have emitted the signal, we have received the signal, we have extracted the features. Now we need to apply a classifier. A classifier is a mathematical methodology. It is a methodology that is used to compare the features that have been extracted with a database of features. Crucially, these mathematical methodologies need to provide two different outputs. A probability of identification and a confidence of the result. So we have the signal, we feed it into the classifier, the classifier does its stuff, and then it tells us that with 70% of probability, this track is this type of aircraft, and I'm confident that I am 90% correct. Actually, from an operational point of view, the most important of the two is the confidence. A low confidence means that the system is basically not doing its job correctly or it is in a condition where it can't do its job correctly, while low probability or a spread probability between different types of aircraft is something that a tactical level can probably be managed. But if the system is not doing the work correctly, so it doesn't really know and is just giving the finger in the air estimation of what the target is, then it pretty much becomes useless.
we have mentioned several times the database. So the first element to understand is that to recognize a target against its features, very different aircraft can have very similar features. And this complicates enormously the task. The second element is that an operator cannot spend its time in trying to oh, compare uh, charts and numbers. There must be an automated process that gives the operator some level of confidence about the identity of the target. Now let's consider a technique like HRRP. It is actually generating a chart of the radar return. Now we need to compare that chart with other charts saved somewhere in the database to, be, to see if we can find a match and then estimate the probability that it is really a match and the confidence that we are in the right as we mentioned before. But obviously this shape, this return varies quite a lot. It varies with the attitude of the target, it varies with the Doppler effect of the target. If there are any stores mounted under the wings, then the return changes. And for every combination of stores, the return changes. For a single aircraft within the database, you may have really a lot of different entries that to actually store your data in the database, you have to somehow measure this data. And it may not be immediately possible. In fact, what you would need is to have your potential enemy aircraft flying around and having your uh, aircraft with its own radar illuminating from all sides the, the target and recording all the returns to be stored into the database, which may be somewhat difficult. The West is in fact ahead from this point of view and this is something which is really quite important because we know that in the United States there are Russian aircraft actually flying and but we don't know exactly if they have anything Chinese but, but actually measuring this thing is a very important function that these aircraft have. Aircraft like the F-35 which are heavily heavily reliant on a correct database of all the potential opponents receive these data in the form of scenario files which are large files of many gigabytes and they are produced in specialized facilities in the United States by theater pretty much so all the aircraft flying in the European theater have a specific file those flying in the Asian theater have an, another type of file and so on and this database is large and uh, the, the F-35 uses it to identify um, all the threats not only for the radar but for all the other sensors as well. Now if you don't have an enemy aircraft to test live what you can do is using models and using uh, test rigs that illuminate these models too and try estimating the return. That's a less than perfect methodology but just another reason why we tend to see all these engagement that seems to happen to harass and uh, stimulate the reaction of the opponent. They just want to take these measurements either from, yeah, obviously from, they want to measure and characterize the opponent's radars uh, and sensors and radios and communications and data links, but they also want to radiate them with the radar from different position and see what the return is. The reason is that if you don't identify a target as hostile, clearly hostile, 100% sure that is hostile, you simply can't fire. In modern warfare, a certain level of friendly fire is unacceptable. Friendly fire must be zero. The reason, other than humanitarian reasons, we believe that human lives are worth more than uh, people believed, uh, I don't know, a couple of centuries ago. The reason is that 
aircraft are definitely worth more they are a larger chunk of military power losing one aircraft today is probably the equivalent of losing i don't know maybe 20 aircraft during the second world war they are much more difficult to replace and they are losing even one aircraft cuts a relatively high percentage of the power available to the air force in some situation you may be sure that a truck is hostile for example if you see the truck taking off from an enemy airbase and you're sure there are no civilian aircraft there so you may classify the target as hostile so you may engage without recognition but in virtually all other cases it is necessary to explicitly identify the truck as hostile and even in a situation where you are east against west you cannot simply assume that everything flying from east to west is hostile it could simply be a lost civilian aircraft it could be one of the allies coming back from a mission uh, in with total emission control so it's not even replying or answering the iff um, so you need the identification the traditional and safest tool for identification is the visual aid identification and one use of the modern ist is actually to extend the range of the visual identification to say medium ranges so you don't really need to get close too much to the aircraft and the reason why these techniques that allow to identify a target using uh, the radar and using the features of the radar returns have been developed because they further extend outward the area where you can do the recognition but with these techniques there are plenty of things that may go wrong for example a jammer that in normal condition may not particularly affect the main radar function of identifying or of tracking a target may prevent may be powerful enough to prevent the target recognition and this is effective as pretty much jamming your weapons because you can't fire in case of a generalized conflict when you have hundreds of aircrafts flying in the same area at the same time this becomes even more important because the possibility of friendly fire actually just increases so since identifying a target as hostile is actually a complex problem that is generally fixed by getting closer to the target part of the effectiveness of the long-range weapons is basically just gone in the american and in general western plans it is always expected that the aircraft don't operate in relative isolation they are expected to operate uh, with the support of a number of assets like uh, radars flying command centers uh, uh, electronic support measures aircraft that can build this picture can help build a consistent picture identify the targets even at long range and through the networking that is now relatively common this picture is actually distributed and can be used so a fighter is expected to have pretty much in every moment of the air battle a relatively good picture of the airspace around it and a very good situational awareness and being able to operate uh, accordingly obviously the weakness of this doctrine is that these assets may not be available for the most disparate reasons if they are not available the overall effectiveness of the entire system degrades immediately we don't know much about the chinese but the russians have a similar doctrine but having let's say just less means they are just let's say less rich than the west they don't rely as heavily as the west does on these assets actually the old russian doctrine of closely controlled intercept missions from the ground is gone they actually realize that it doesn't work against modern western air forces so they totally changed 
they tend to be still very procedural when it comes to air to ground but in air to air they actually have flip flopped and changed direction 180 degrees the obvious consequence of this condition is that that whatever range advantage you may have you may well end up in during rear operation in the condition of not being capable of using it and this is the reason why short range combat is still relevant and in fact pilots still train for it and now if you want to know more about this please watch the videos that are going to appear beside me thank you very much for watching and see you next time